Welcome to our fifth installment of the Future of Solar Photovoltaics podcast. I'm Vikram from Ventus Cables and Connectivity. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of hosting Mr. Arnold Claren. Arnold, welcome. Hi, Vikram. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me at this podcast. Fantastic. Arnold, we first met in the Shard in 2016 during the controversial Brexit referendum, but also towards the end of the first major large-scale solar construction boom in the UK. We always had an intense ambience to our conversations, not only because of the height of your office in the Shard or the triple glazing blocking all phone signals, but also due to the sheer speed at which Foresight were acquiring solar farms in the UK and your meticulous attention to details such as DC string cables and connectors was putting us in in touch. Uh, so, um, Arnold, uh, are you able to uh, tell us a bit more about your background, about what you do now, you know, who, who you are, before we get into the specific yeah. questions? Sure, of course. Um, well, uh, okay, well, I mean, first of all, again, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, I've been listening to uh, some of the previous episodes, which were really interesting to listen to and to just hear about uh, you know other professionals in the solar sector and how they experienced the uh, solar boom and um, uh, period since then um about myself uh, so i um, i'm dutch i uh, studied electrical engineering in the netherlands um, and um and well i, I guess um uh, you know when we talk about uh, solar or renewables maybe specifically um you know, that actually started uh, in a certain way already back then. Uh, when I was uh, studying, I had a, uh, we were, we all had to do a practical assignment at uh, the university where I studied. Uh, um, you know, they were encouraging students to do that, to do that abroad. Um, and, um, you know, of course, I could have chosen, uh, you know, Germany or England or the US, but those countries felt like places where it wouldn't be too hard to end up, uh, you know, later in life. So I, I, I looked for an opportunity that um, was something, you know, special, something that's not so easy to do later on. And it turned out that it was also possible to do the assignment in Kathmandu, Nepal. Wow. Um, yeah. And um, now I must admit, uh, now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later what it was about, but it was about, um, you know, um, in, in a way it was connected to re renewables. That mm -hmm. was not, you know, at that moment a reason to do it. It was just the, uh, you know, the whole, adventure of, of going there but um the company where i was going to be the next five months um was a local company that was um uh, doing micro hydro generators to be installed in the himalayas to give small communities uh electricity um and uh you know they um Mm, they needed um, a controller to be designed uh, because otherwise, if you don't have that, the voltage and frequency will vary, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the amount of water that goes through um, the turbine or the, um, the use or the consumption by the village. Um, so, you know, and I'm mentioning this because this was actually my first exposure to renewables, but also because I learned a very, very valuable lesson there. Um, mm -hmm. The um, previous to me, there was a student who had already uh, built the first version of the controller. And how this worked uh, was surprising to me and to most people, um, which is the following. The, the amount of water that goes into the generator is generally the same. So it takes water from uh, the river flowing down uh, the mountains, goes through a pipe, through a nozzle, and then it hits a belt and wheel that makes a turbine spin. Now, that's always pretty much the same amount of water. So that doesn't change much. But the people who use the electricity, you know, they may be asleep, they may be awake, they may be using the lights uh, or, uh, you know, a heater. So uh, the consumption varied uh, all the time. And that made, if you wouldn't have a, a, a controller or something that controls the system, that would then, you know, uh, raise and lower the voltage, which would, of course, damage the equipment connected to it. So... Of course, you can think of many ways to deal with that, uh, very sophisticated ways. But the way how it was done was that uh, they uh, they would typically build like a pool, like a sort of kind of swimming pool next to the mm -hmm. generator, mm -hmm. um, and they would put they would put uh, dozens or hundreds of um, heating elements in there. So the typical spiral uh, heating elements that you could use to heat up, you know, water in a cup if you wanted to. That's very popular um, in a bowl to use and very easy to obtain. So they would mm -hmm. put those in there, and then the controller, all it would do is it would keep the consumption the same. So if the, if the village 
would be using a lot of electricity, it wouldn't direct uh, much power uh, to the heaters. But in the other way around, if they would use, uh, for example, a lot of, um, or if they wouldn't use any uh, ele electricity, then those elements would heat up and it would just heat up the water. Now, people ask me, and what would you do with the, with the warm water? You, you, you do nothing with that. That's not the idea. The idea is just that you balance it and that's the cheapest way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so then the question is, people ask me, that's not very efficient. You know, you're throwing away all, all that energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's very interesting, right? Because that's not of the requirements for those people. The, the, there is no loss of ele ele um, electricity because the water is flowing down the mountain, whether it goes through the turbine or not, it's the same. But for mm -hmm. the village, it's very important that they have an easy, cheap system, so low capex, It's very easy to repair. They only need very uh, easy sourceable components, so low OPEX. And efficiency is has no importance at all in this case. So, you know, sometimes when I mean, you design something, uh, you know, your design requirements may, um, may be different to what you first expect. So that's always important to take into account. And I think that's been an important lesson early on in, in the career that uh, continues to be valuable further on. So you have good, good uh, experience of hydroelectricity or micro hydro, hydro, let's say. There is a company in the UK called Dulles that's been doing this since the 80s as well. So, you know, uh -huh. the, the, that's, that's certainly very interesting. You spent quite a long time studying electrical engineering in, in the <laughs> University of Twente in the Netherlands. And what, what, what made you want to choose Nepal and, uh, and uh, micro hydro as your, as your university project? Yeah, well, I mean, it really was, I must admit it, uh, the Nepal part was more important than micro-hydro generation. Right. <laughs> it was just, you know, to go as far away as possible and the biggest adventure as possible. So that was really the reason. And, and that's also the reason why it took a bit longer uh, for me to study. I, I, I've been traveling quite a bit during my studies. I thought if I don't do it now, will I have the opportunity to do it later? Um, so, um, so, so, yeah, yeah no, I wouldn't call myself at all uh, an expert on the hydro generation because this was the only thing I've done with it. And it was obviously in a very different um, mm -hmm. setting than, uh, you know, you would do in, in uh, a developed country uh, or you know, in, in the UK or anywhere else. But it was a very good experience, nevertheless. Fantastic. And then... Uh... You somehow ended up in Spain uh, doing concentrated solar. You know, this isn't the same as photovoltaics. This is concentrating mirrors uh, mm. and, and probably melting salt mines. You know, are you able to share a bit more details about that experience? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I did end up in Spain. Uh, that was, uh, you know, um, because of, uh, of love, because of a, a woman, uh, which I think uh, is often the reason for people to change uh, a country. So, um, and I've never regretted it. Uh, I love uh, living in Spain. I'm living there now. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah. Through a few steps, I um, I joined in Madrid uh, a company that um, is a uh, it's called Sofocus. Uh, mm -hmm. They were a um, startup company um, based uh, in Silicon Valley. And um, this was, uh, when they started, it was about 2005, 2006. I joined in 2008. Um, they had seen back at the time that there was a good business case uh, to do solar in a different way than PV because back in the time, as you and everybody else will know, uh, PV panels, uh, silicon was all very expensive, you know, many, many, many more times than it is now. Mm -hmm. And um, that was just really stopping it from deploying its large scale. So, uh, of course, there was concentrated solar power. That's what you just referred to, where you heat up, uh, in a way, you know, water or a liquid and uh, run a turbine. And that's where, you know, the, the salt, et cetera, comes from. But this is slightly different. This is CPV, so concentrated photovoltaics. Right, right. Um, not CSP, is, um, not, not the mirrors. Exactly. Well, no, well, <laughs> there are mirrors. Um, I'll explain it. Um, so what they did is they created a... Um, a panel which was about 15 centimeters deep and um, that was enough uh, to uh, to fit in uh, mirrors that were if I can just explain it uh, by comparing it to a car headlight so a right. car headlight you have the bulb in the middle and then the light is reflected onto one mirror in the front it goes back to a second mirror and then it goes out in a very straight beam Mm -hmm. um, now, if you use the same design in the other way around, then you know the sun is shining into this this mirror system onto a primary mirror, and it shines shines back out onto a secondary mirror, and then back in through a gap in the middle of the primary mirror onto 
uh, and high uh, efficiency cell, which uh, at that time was a triple junction cell. So let's say it was the same kind of technology that they would use in space. Mm-hmm. Now that's very expensive, but because yes. you only need one square centimeter because the light is concentrated mm-hmm. 500 times or 700 times onto that little bit, as long as you're able to cool it and make it efficient, then mm-hmm. that was giving a higher efficiency than normal PV panels at the time. But it had a, a drawback, of course. It's, um, it had to be mounted onto a very precise two-axis tracker. Um, and at the time, that seems more or less logical. You may remember maybe in Spain in those times, there was a very um, high uh, feed-in tariff of um, 44 cents per kilowatt hour uh, RPI linked. Um, and um, so, you know, at that time, it made sense. It was cheaper to build solar like that than with PV. Um, and that was, uh, you know, a great experience. I I, uh, I also learned something else there, which was that, you know, at some point, um, it did happen that um, um, unexpectedly, we, said, we suddenly found, I actually found in the field, you know, that the mirrors were, were cracking. Now, this was the very first generation of the product, but of course, this was not supposed to happen. Um, right. Uh, the design, the designers never thought it could happen because they had, you know, they had already obviously thought about that possibility and mitigated mm-hmm. it as they thought. So now, mm-hmm. of course, they fixed it. And there was a new generation, and eventually the company doesn't exist anymore because it was overtaken by normal PV solar. But right. I think you know it was a very good um, lesson for me to realize how new technology comes with a risk of not having a track records, right? So um, you know, this was a good example of uh, how something that has been engineered and very, very thoroughly is still new and still things can happen that uh, nobody expected, as was the case here. Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking at your LinkedIn pro- profile. I see sole focus was January 20, 2008 till October 2011. I personally got into PV because of the financial crisis. You know, I was in industrial sales and typical construction and all of those sectors were, you know, on their knees and PV and wind were the only bo- booming um, <laughs> areas that I could find uh, during this period. Uh, did, did you have any experience of the financial crisis itself? You know, did that affect you in any way during your time at Soul Focus? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, when when at Soul Focus, the, um, the, the management was seeing how um, PV prices were coming down, you know, they kept adjusting their business model to cope with that. But eventually, um, also because I think in a crisis, um, people are more risk averse. So as I just mentioned, to uh, do a project in solar with a new technology or with proven technology, it became, you know, you could notice how the market became a little bit more risk averse. And then together with the fact that PV became cheaper and cheaper, uh, you know, it wasn't looking very good. So I was, um, you know, I was looking uh, to change jobs and um, you know, I made it clear on my LinkedIn profile and I, I looked around and things weren't looking very good in Spain at all, to be honest. Um, and, um, and then um, I was contacted by, uh, by Headhunter in the UK that, uh, that uh, made me aware of um, this opportunity. Now, I should tell you that this is, of course, when I moved uh, to, to Foresight. Um, now, Foresight uh, had a, uh, an office in, in Spain back at the time. Right. Um, and it was had just started about a year before. There's one person working there, um, and the idea was to uh, strengthen that team, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was very exciting because I always enjoy very much to join uh, startup com- companies. Um, uh, I had myself a startup company in earlier years as well, um, so that was the idea. But I, I proposed to them to move to London for half a year to really get to know the team and to, you know, to get the experience and then go back to live in Spain um, and stay there. And that's, they agreed to that. So, uh, you know, we moved over there. Um, and um, during those six months, you know, things were getting worse and worse with the crisis and Spain was particularly hit, uh, you know, badly. And at some point, um, the company decided uh, to shut down the, uh, the Madrid office. Um, which obviously then uh, <laughs> didn't allow me to um, to go to go to, to back to uh, to to, uh, to Spain uh, for foresight. So uh, we decided to stay, and that mm-hmm. was fine because, of course, as we now know, there was um, there was some big things. Um, there were some big things happening, going to happen in the UK. Now, when I was there, all we had at the time were a few Spanish assets, um, and we just bought a few months before I joined. 
um, the first five megawatt feed project in Kent, Ilsford, Kent, was was built, and that was the first project I was exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, that, that's how I ended up in the UK, and um, and from there on, of course, uh, that was the first site, and um, I would be uh, involved with the next uh, sixty three acquisitions um, that Foresight made from there onwards uh, up to uh, 2018. Of course. Um, b- yeah. Before we go uh, uh, deeper into your UK experience, you know, what, what were your... Because I remember there was um, the Spanish embassy and all the Spanish companies were coming over and then they were quite upset about retroactive duties or something like this. Lots of people moved to the UK. I think the Spanish solar boom was one of the early ones together with the Netherlands and Germany and then everyone seemed to then uh, um, uh, focus on the UK market. But in terms of context of the, over the last decade or so, you know, what, what, what were your memories of, of the cost of PV in terms of pens per watt of modules or construction sure. uh, so, so solar projects? You know, now that we look at 2023, we're looking at module pricing going below 10 cents a watt for solar panels themselves, mm. for Topcon solar panels and type potentially. You know, so if you look back at that period with Sol Focus and just before you you uh, shut down the Spain office with Foresight and moved to the UK, do you, do you have any recollections of what the pricing was then? Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, EPC, I think was around, it depends on the size of the plant, which are much smaller, so it would be more expensive per, per megawatt, but, it, you know, it was like six, seven, eight um, uh, euros per, per watt. To install, you know, those smaller uh, PV plants. So, you know, that was um, obviously that's now more than ten times less than that. And mostly driven, of course, by the panels, as you just mentioned, um, the, um, the cells and the panels, which um, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, so panels apparently are now, um, you know, in the range of uh, you know fifteen to twenty cents. Um, but uh, also inverters, of course, have come down uh, very significantly. And, um, and structure as well. Structure may, may, may be mostly because of the design. You know, when feed and tires were still there and there was quite a lot of mm-hmm. money, you know, mm-hmm. you wouldn't want to take a risk. So you would take, you know, a strong structure and you would do things. Uh, you know, if you look at the two excess trackers, you know, there were, there were some beasts out there with a huge amount of material. So, you know, also by redesigning, uh, things were made cheaper. But there's also another example that I can give you maybe based on, experience because we talk about epc and we talk about supply chain but then um, also for example in the o m range people may not maybe not everybody has a view or an idea of how what kind of prices there were in o m um for example in spain when we still had that very high tariff uh so 44 cents rpi linked for 25 years um mm. and also i must admit it's important to to explain that often the epc and o m contract were negotiated together and um, the value was sometimes a little bit mixed uh, was my experience so sometimes maybe to make the EPC more attractive they would maybe make the uh, O&M more expensive than it needed uh, to, to, uh, to, to be um, you know I, that you know you could sometimes see that that was being um, put together in that way uh, by the seller whether it was accepted or not by the buyer I'll leave that in the middle but um, so what uh, I have seen was a site um, which had a contract uh, from very early days that was um, at a cost of 50,000 uh, wow. euros per megawatt, RPI linked, and then there was also a yield-based bonus on top of that. Um, so, um, you know, compare that uh, to nowadays where maybe the range of an o m could be roughly, within, let's say, between 5 and 10K, which depends on the scope and the exclusions, um, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, pretty much a, uh, also factor 10. So it's not, you know, we're also focused on the panels, but the uh, sector has experienced a vast reduction, uh, you know, across the various different, uh, you know, parts of the sector, in this case, o as well. So 50,000, uh, is this 50,000 euros per megawatt for o in this time? Yeah, yeah, that wow. once existed. <laughs> Yeah, it's, so, it's crazy. Well, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. crazy how things have uh, uh, changed so much because now it seems to be a complete, um, complete uh, uh, reduction in the in the in the budget allowed for O and M uh, as as the prices have 
naturally come down. But then in 2011 is then, as you say, the big one where you move uh, to London with with foresight. You know, what were your first early impressions when when you moved to the UK? Well, I should I should um, correct you there. I didn't actually uh, move to London uh, because right. when I joined Foresight, um, it was um, a much more modest company than uh, we know now. In fact, a lot of people in the solar sector obviously didn't know Foresight because you know they mm-hmm. hadn't really entered the sector yet. So I was the uh, I was number forty uh, employee wise, um, and we were based in Seven Oaks, uh, so just south of London. Um, right. And um, I remember that, uh, you know, while they were growing, one of the difficulties was to attract uh, people because, you know, people were, you know, normally uh, used to commute into London, not out uh, of London into Seven Oaks. (laughs) Um, So, um, you know, it was a very uh, nice company to join. Uh, I enjoyed uh, enjoyed it a lot. I I first looked to live in London and... um, I made a common mistake that many foreigners make when they come to London when we ask for what the uh, the rent uh, pricing was. And this is, you know, already a long time ago. So I imagine now yeah. you know, they uh, they said, oh, it's uh, this amount, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we thought, oh, well, that's actually more or less what we have budgeted for. So, hey, that's great. We can have some very nice places in London. And then it turned out that um, in London, for some reason, the prices are expressed uh, in weekly prices, not in monthly prices. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it became times four. So yeah. about the next, very next day, we were uh, taking the train to Seven Oaks to see what kind of nice places we could rent there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, we were able to rent a very nice place. Now, of course, so we didn't so, so much, um, um, in, you know, we're not able to enjoy so much the uh, real London experience, but... Um, when Forst had moved to London, we moved to Brighton for another few years. Uh, nice. So that was a longer, the, the commute was a bit longer, but it was okay. And, and Brighton is a very exciting place to be as well. So so I guess you know, moving to England was a really interesting experience. Of course, first we thought we were going to be there six months and then it was much longer. Yeah. But um, but that didn't matter. I mean, uh, you know, we've done so much. We've, uh, you know, really tried to enjoy it as much as possible. And um, it's true that say Seven Oaks maybe after a few years becomes a little bit local. Um, mm-hmm. So, but we solved that by moving to 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 Brighton, which is a lovely uh, city uh, where we also had a great time. Well, one of the unique things about you were that you know you were already in foresight from uh, October 2011. You had background in the PV business. I started full time with PV in March 2012. So it was refreshing to see that you know you, you um, with the background in electrical engineering. Actually, uh, working for an investor, actually taking an interest in in the mm. deep technical uh, uh, issues, because quality is a big thing in PV, you know. And uh, um, I have notes here, you know, that uh, you 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 started to focus more on the FAC process. What what does FAC stand for? What what is it exactly? Yeah, so that's the final uh, acceptance certificate or final acceptance test. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so now that's a very interesting uh, subject that uh, that. Um, that you are raising now. Um, mm-hmm. So um, you're right. When uh, when I joined, um, you know, it was difficult at that time to find people with solar experience in the UK, um, and that may very well have been the reason why um, why um, the recruiter reached out to me while I was actually living in, in Spain. Um, the um, you know things have changed so much. If you just remind ourselves that solar in the beginning, the way how funds worked was that, you know, they were risk averse and Mm -hmm. um, they felt that the best way to deal with uh, solar was to, um, you know, to only actually uh, purchase uh, the site uh, at PEC. So PEC is the uh, provisional acceptance uh, test or certificates, which is something Mm -hmm. that you do right after the site uh, is Mm -hmm. connected to see if it's working properly. And then there is a two-year period um, during normally, the, sometimes there's a test halfway after one year, which is the intermediate acceptance test, and then there is the final acceptance test. Now, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, um, the idea was that, okay, if we get to the dead point, we're not taking any construction risk, we can see mm-hmm. that the asset is working, mm-hmm. and we still have another two years to see if it's working, so surely that will then uh, you know, be a good guarantee that the asset will last for 25 years because keep in mind that from a fund perspective, fund manager's perspective, you know, 
there are you know no technical people in foresight mm-hmm. they were technical people because they were mm-hmm. already mm-hmm. working uh, with other assets like biomass and things like that but uh, but generally of course these are all financial people so they look at an asset and they just need to know what will we spend on the asset and what will it generate now generation of course you know why solar is so popular especially when there was a feed-in tariff because yes. you know you know the the solar uh, source the solar radiation is um, it may change from one day to the other but from one year to the other it is nearly identical from year to year mm-hmm. and with the subsidy you know it is identical as well uh, mm-hmm. so if you multiply and if your availability is pretty good which the, the idea was that solar solar panels would run basically themselves so the three factors that could influence the final you know uh, yield or the final uh, investment, the, the money that they generate, though they were all really, really um, stable. So, you know, that of course was the reason why uh, finance uh, and the finance it, 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 um, in the industry really liked um, solar assets. Um, but um, so it, well, they had in mind that they would spend a certain amount of money on an OM contract, a certain amount of money on the MRA, the maintenance reserve account. And then mm-hmm. they would know what they would get for that. So um, now it turned out, of course, that it isn't exactly like that. Um, and it has to do with the following. The, uh, everybody's trying to make money. That is mm-hmm. the way how our world works. And um, the EPC, of course, they, they are very closely looking at how to design the site and how to build it. And you know, in reality, the OM or the EPC com- uh, com- contract may say that the asset is, should be built for a 25 year lifetime, mm-hmm. but they are really on the hook for two years. Yeah. Now, okay, so any every EPC will have a different view on that. Some EPCs maybe were building sites to keep themselves for longer, or maybe you know they they want to make sure that sites were built really well. But you know, inevitably and completely understandably. When you look at the numbers, you know, you're being asked every time internally, you know, should we build it like this or that? Because this is slightly cheaper. This is slightly cheaper. And in the end, if your liability is two years, you know, you will find that it is, um, you know, very attractive to Mm -hmm. build a site that will work very well, at least for, you know, for the first few years. But maybe it's not built to that extreme precision and quality. That would mean that it doesn't require, you know, anything else but normal maintenance for 25 years. It's a real different concept. Um, so um, we realized that those two years that we had were actually really important. That was the moment for us to determine, to try to estimate if the plant would really last 25 years yes. or yep. if it wouldn't. And, um, and I think we, we were very early with realizing this in the sector, maybe earlier than others, maybe not everybody else, but I mean in the front line, if you like. So we organized, um, you know, panel inspections on sites by laboratories. We um, were very early with drone uh, inspection, um, and um, um, you know, we were um, we would contact the um, the. Um, um, manufacturers of the inverters, for example, to make sure that they would come to site to make sure that they were that the that their devices were maintained properly and they would uh, honor uh, the warranty that was still ongoing. And uh, you know, on HV, we were trying to see if partial discharge activity uh, measurements could help us there. Um, oil samples, visual inspections, and uh, you know, and I think what's important to to explain here is that because we realized the importance of this, uh, you know, internally we uh, we thought it was uh, you know a good idea to create a larger technical team. You saw that other companies were very more focused on commercial asset managers, but mm-hmm. foresight, um, you know, uh, I was uh, privileged to uh, to build up a team, and uh, I think we were in the end we were ten. 10 people, and uh, whenever we hired somebody, we would hire somebody with a, sp- a specific expertise so that the mm-hmm. overall team would have mm-hmm. a broader and broader expertise. Um, and, you know, in the end, uh, we had a team that was very good at, uh, you know, uh, complex due diligence, uh, you know, uh, asset management, in-depth performance, monitoring, construction monitoring. And 
you know, I'd really like to take this opportunity to um, to say, and I often say this, that I still feel that my proudest achievement at Foresight has actually been building this team, this team that mm-hmm. was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so, so good at doing all this, yeah. You get to look look back on your colleagues, and uh, hopefully they are all progressing in their careers. You know, and because of the nature of these big infrastructure projects, there's always uh, a certain amount of risk. You know, we can't really talk about uh, you know any confidential stuff. But uh, uh, generally speaking, from a risk management point of view, any EPCs or funds that might listen to our podcast or uh, future managers or engineers or, or buyers. You know, I've heard this so often, you know, the EPC is only on the hook for two years. The EPCs themselves have said that, you know, we only need to look after this or do O&M for, for two years for uh, any project that we might do the engineering, procurement, construction for. But from from, from a legal standpoint, it, it, did you have any experience that, that, that proves otherwise? You know, if once you've done your final acceptance testing at the end of the two years and had a handover, uh, the project, if it should have a 25-year design life and it's completely falling apart in year three or four, who is then liable for for, for the maintenance sure. and the performance? Sure. Well, as you, as you said in the beginning, I, I can't go into any specific detail, but I can explain how the, how the, how the process works. So mm-hmm. why is the FEC so important? Uh, the FEC is important because um, of two reasons, I think. The first reason is that... Um, it's also the moment um, when the EPC warranty expires. So let's say on any, you know, component defects or issues with design, you know, that is the last moment where you can bring that up. Um, but uh, more importantly, um, when we talk about performance ratio, right? So this is a, a KPI, a key performance indicator, of course, in the solar um, in industry, where you, um, which is a measure for how. Um, you know how uh, what the performance is of your plants, um, and um, uh, this is uh, contractually fixed. So um, you know there would be a certain amount uh, of PR, a certain level that the site would need to be able to to do, and mm-hmm. um, this is measured across those two years. And if it falls short, um, and this is indeed important, it's not just that um, the EPC is required to um, compensate you for you know the losses that you've suffered in those two years because of the shortage um is actually calculated going forward as well so right. uh, you know there are 25 years about 23 years left um mm-hmm. so there is of course a bit of net present value involved so it's not exactly like that but um you would calculate you know what would i have generated had it done the right pr and it yeah. hasn't now so what are my losses over all of that this time you know, so that there will be a certain calculation that both parties would have agreed on that moment of signing the EPC. So this mm-hmm. is why it's so important uh, because um, you know it's it's it can really be uh, a significant amount. Now the good news, of course, is that the EPC is often also the the uh, the own the ONM during the first two years, so they they can monitor the site as well, and they have two years time to uh, to review this and to mitigate the risk of this happening at the end because it is much better for them of course to resolve things uh, during mm-hmm. those two years than having to be liable for something that is calculated uh, going forward in the way I just explained mm-hmm. fantastic and you, you mentioned you know the, the solar roller coaster or what we say the solar coaster uh, mm-hmm. as an abbreviation you know and it's it's been a boom and bust uh, industry you know uh, first there's been changes in feeding tariffs in Germany, in Spain, in other countries, and then we had the mm. grid connection deadlines, and we had the MIP and the anti-dumping duties, and yeah. uh, then we had the UK feeding tariff uh, cost reductions, and you know lots of high-profile company failures, so um, it's been tough for the EPCs to even keep going, because you know uh, mm. uh, the margins have reduced, and the volumes have, have, have picked up, so it's an interesting point, you know, about the design life, and you know what happens to these projects for the for the remaining uh, twenty three years, or now people are talking about forty uh, solar farms. Yeah. Uh, and then, so in twenty nineteen, uh, you, you you transitioned to another company. Please again, uh, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong. Is it Quintas or Quintas? <laughs> Both names are are <laughs> are often used. So uh, yeah, I, I call it Quintas Energy. Um, but um, yes, indeed. So. Um, so I had the opportunity to move back uh, to Spain and um, then moving to Quintas allowed me to, um, to actually uh, 
work from home uh, on the uh, southern coast of Spain. So, you know, after m- my family had been moving around, uh, you know, uh, quite a few times, this was a great opportunity to settle down. Um, and uh, the other opportunity that was there is that, um, so it's a little bit about Kintas before I continue. Um, um, Kintas is an, an asset manager in solar and storage. Um, and uh, start, it started in 2007. Uh, mm-hmm. But I know them already since 2012 because um, uh, we took them on board uh, at Foresight uh, as well for, for some of the services that they uh, provide. Um, and um, um, they, uh, uh, back at the time, of course, they, they grew uh, a, a lot, just like Foresight did. And uh, today, uh, you know, the great thing is that uh, we have now um, over eight gigawatts uh, of solar right. and some storage under management in various mm-hmm. countries like Spain, UK, Italy, and Australia. And, um, you know, already a few years ago, um, the, uh, our clients, you know, they were often requesting services that were outside of the um, asset management scope. So mm-hmm. in order to uh, provide them with, with those services in 2019, just when I joined, Mm-hmm. We started Kintasa Advisory, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that has been uh, a really uh, interesting experience because you know after you know all the things that I got involved in over the previous years, I now had uh, the op- op- um, opportunity to you know to be involved with all kind of different clients and portfolios in the countries that that I just mentioned, and um, and uh, you know I, I have been exposed to lots of different things so. If I was already exposed to a lot of interesting uh, new things every day in foresight, it has only mm-hmm. continued or even intensified. Um, mm-hmm. the, um, I would say what has been real change in the sector logically is that where, as you mentioned earlier, with the uh, the solar coaster, um, you know, particularly in the early years, 2013, 14, 15, you know, I was involved in a new um, actually, acquisition almost on a, on a weekly basis, or maybe every two, 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 two weeks. It was just that was how things went: just acquire, right. acquire, acquire. Now, of mm-hmm. course, most of the funds they have a large portfolio and they can't grow that quickly anymore. And uh, so now it's all about performance of what you have, you know, optimizing of what you have. Um, you know, there is um, there is of course um, repowering happening. Um, there may be some claims. There may be all kinds of issues. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's all, uh, but there's also the development and construction that's also going on, of course, at the same time. So there's a lot going on. And um, that's logical, of course, with the um, the goal uh, of going to net zero in 2050, um, with intermediate goals like the 2030 goal, uh, you know, you can only imagine uh, if first uh, all our electricity should be renewable, but then also all our cars should also be electrical. And eventually we would want to even make cement or steel uh, in a uh, sustainable way. You can only imagine what that means for the solar sector. So, um, yeah, very exciting. But also, as you just said, the ups and downs are here too. We have so much work ahead, but at the same time, it's so difficult, right? The grid, the grid is almost full. Um, you know, there's maybe more op- opposition to solar plants, especially large ones, because there are more and more. So, you know, challenges keep changing. Uh, we need to deal with those in one way or another. And and you said eight gigawatts of assets under management. Is it mostly solar? Yes. Uh, yes, we do uh, solar and storage. Um, yeah, indeed. And, and in your day-to-day role, you know... Uh... Well, what sort of things do you get involved with and, and what do you expect from potential partners that may, that may look to work with you? Yeah. So, I mean, again, there are so many different areas. I mean, if I mention uh, a few, so obviously if it is about uh, new development or construction, um, then, you know, there's a lot to think about. Uh, there are, you know, the storage, of course. Um, there is uh, bifacial. Um, there is... Uh, also, you know, how do you work with uh, your contractors? You know, uh, that has changed as well over time, especially if you want to build a portfolio. It's all about uh, creating, uh, you know, creating um, teams and creating relationships. Um, so, um, so there's a lot going on over there. 
Um, mm-hmm. But also in the uh, operational side, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, one thing that has been really interesting is that you can see that clients are um, moving away from trying to deal um, uh, on an incident by incident basis with their portfolio. Um, mm-hmm. Because when an incident happens, of course, uh, you know, you can repair things as quickly as possible, but it may still take time. And in the meantime, you have business in interruption and it's yep. always... You know, you're always surprised by something. It's difficult to uh, manage your cash flow. It's more difficult to manage your investors' expectations. So you can see there is an increasing interest in uh, risk management, right? To which yeah. extent can you apply risk management to solar? And of course, many sectors have that. You know, uh, you wouldn't wait for an airplane to fail, right? You, you would have a process in place to reduce risk, calculate risk, reduce risk. So you can apply mm-hmm. similar things to every sector, in this case, solar. So, um, you know, one thing that we're seeing is, you know, how can we, you know, how can clients uh, control and manage uh, their portfolio uh, by um, having a clear picture of all the type of risks and all the risks that they have in their portfolio and then, you know, in advance um, deal with those that they want to deal with by mitigating them in some way or another and then bringing down the amount of incidents. So you are investing more in mitigation, but of course you should be able to pay that by having less costs due to instant repair and particularly business interruption, which is what you would reduce mostly when you uh, mitigate things in advance. Um, Maybe one other thing to mention, which has also been, uh, you know, something more recent, security. So, um, you know, in the early days, uh, security was an afterthought for most uh, asset owners. It wasn't really affecting uh, the production and there Mm -hmm. was no real track record of theft. Um, right. So um, now at Foresight, back at the days, we, uh, were, we always insisted in having a, a very good and capable security system. Uh, but, you know, sometimes other uh, owners were tempted uh, or hadn't really realized or they didn't ask for something like that. So the EPCs were maybe left uh, more free to do whatever they want. So eventually maybe we ended up with just, um, you know, protection a fence and if uh, the wire was physically cut in the fence then maybe the alarm would go but why would who would you know cut deliberately uh, you know a wire <laughs> so yeah you know we've seen that kind of things um so uh i think what what we now see is since then there have been more thefts uh every country where there's solar in the beginning there tends to be very little and then you know thefts mm-hmm. start to you know the thieves start to uh, realize what solar parks are where they are and what they can get there and how to break in so, mm-hmm. you know, um, we've also dealt with that by, for example, uh, by, um, you know, how can you spend your money in the most efficient way? Uh, so, for example, does every park need to have the same type of security or does the park, maybe if it's next to a, a river, do you really need to have the same kind of investment than another park? And, um, you know, uh, one thing that we found, for example, was that um, if uh, an alarm goes, uh, mm-hmm. You know, if there's an alarm, you think, okay, that's it. We now know something is happening. But then yeah. you normally send a guard, especially if you're not sure and you can't send the police, you send the guard. But right. when we looked into this, we realized that, that the guards, um, these are always different people, right? There's a very huge amount of people working uh, as guards at night. And uh, the, the chances of, of the same guard being sent out to the same solar park twice are slim. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, since they are new to us, they would not have had an induction by the operator and therefore mm-hmm. you know t- you would expect them not to be allowed to go onto site especially not at night uh, with all the dangers there as well so you know mm-hmm. the next question is what is the value of a security system if all it does it triggers somebody to go to the front gate shining a torch you know into a 50 megawatt site you know 100 hectares of terrain you know what's mm-hmm. that going to do Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so finding answers to those kind of questions is, is, for example, you know, one of the very, very many things that uh, that, that we've been doing l- lately. And uh, it's very interesting to see that after all of those years, in the beginning, especially when when solar was, uh, people would say, you know, solar parks run themselves and people didn't kind of couldn't think of any yeah. kind of problem. Like panels don't need maintenance. Yeah. Transformers will last 50 years as as they always did until solar. And, uh, you know, what could possibly go wrong, right? This was the yeah, fault yeah, in 2011. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen that every single day I'm learning something new. And every single day I'm addressing a new problem. And uh, it's very exciting. And I hope I'll be doing this until I retire, to be honest. <laughs> 
Absolutely. You know, uh, solar cost is a very important thing because, you know, to solve climate change, we need the energy to become uh, very, very competitive. But uh, in terms of the construction quality, you know, it's uh, and and the maintenance, you know, if, if, if you buy it cheap, you buy it twice, you know, and uh, we're learning that, you know, you talk about transformers, it's even worse in energy storage, the transformer failure rate, and it, it's, it's something we learn for the future. But in terms of security, you know, what, what, what are the high risk areas? Uh, from my own perspective, you know, people love to steal copper because, you know, it used to be five euros per kilo, now eight or nine euros per kilo. And it's very easy to calculate from a data sheet, you know, how many tons of copper you have. Uh, one, one of the things we do to mitigate is try not to use any copper when we can help it. String cable as well, it's uh, tinned copper, so it's not that easy to recycle. People don't always know mm. that. They steal it and then you find it dumped somewhere. But from your <laughs> actual primary uh, source uh, perspective, what, what, what are the high-risk areas in terms of security that needs to be guarded against? Well, you, you made a very good point. So, of course, uh, not having copper on site or as minimum as possible, that would be the first mm. step. Of course, that's not always easy when your plant is already built. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it starts already, as you just uh, very uh, very good pointed out, it starts at the time that you de design a plant, make sure that there is as little um, that is worth stealing, so particularly mm -hmm. copper-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise, you know, the difficulty with solar plants is that you, you can't, you can really only protect the, the perimeter around it. So, um, so it is really very much about detection and then finding a way uh, to um, interrupt any theft going on and minimize your losses. You can do a few things on site. You know, you could, for example, uh, fix panels onto the structure, you know, with uh, fixing material that's not easy to undo. Um, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. again, against cabling, you know, what can you do against somebody cutting cables? You know, that's very mm -hmm. difficult. So mm -hmm. it really is important that, um, that you detect and deter and uh, and uh, you know uh, inter um, intervene. Um, so you know it is a it's an, a, a, a challenge, right? Solar parks are always built uh, far away on cheaper land. Um, you know, so um, so you know that's why I'm mentioning it. It is maybe something that still escapes people's attention. Uh, but um, you know, it is just like uh, you want the site to. Uh, to be uh, available, you know, 100% of the time uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want to fix quickly, you know, an inverter or something like like that. But sometimes mm -hmm. security is a bit of an afterthought. But, you know, that doesn't affect the day-to-day -day generation. But if there is suddenly a huge theft, your plant, you know, could be down for months to come while it's being repaired and while you need to source, you know, mm -hmm. new equipment, etc. So um, it is one of those things that isn't immediately on somebody's radar until it's too late. Well, my opinion on security is, you know, there's there's a lot of solar panels on site, so it would be very difficult for them to steal all of them. You know, they weigh 20 kilograms, so they're quite big like TVs, and, you know, carrying so many of them is very difficult. But uh, on the other side, you know, cables are a lower percentage, but, you know, people can wrap up the whole string cable and your whole site's down suddenly, or if they take out, a, you know, high-voltage cable or the main DC or LVAC, you know, it affects a massive volume of sight and uh, one of the yeah. things we didn't talk about in 2019 you moved to uh, spain with, with with quintas is that 2020 mm. you know whole lives were changed with with the pandemic and mm. you know this this changed lots of priorities for people you know lots of uh, changes one of the uh, rude things in terms of r d disruption was you know we were working on ways of eliminating string cable completely by des designing a, a solar bus uh, system where you can plug mm. the modules directly into a bus collection system and mm. then directly bury the, the bus cable. It's difficult to steal cable, which is directly buried uh, in 900 millimeters or one meter deep in ground. So it's, it's something we have on the radar for the future, you know, to get completely get rid of string cable. You know, for, you know we sell a high quality string cable, but if someone asks you what is the best way to deal with string cable risk, it's to, I would say to completely get rid of it because it's mm -hmm. unarmored, 1500 or 1000 volt DC. It's, it's susceptible to theft, but also other issues like uh, moisture ingress and, and so on. But we won't go too much uh, deep into that. You know, the, the, the goal of this podcast is to discuss the future of of solar photovoltaics uh, as, as an interesting area, as a potential technology to uh, decarbonize and, and to increase energy security. From your perspective, you know what what is the future of solar photovoltaics? How much energy can we generate from solar in Europe? <laughs> um, right. Well, I mean, 
I, it seems to me clear that the, you know the solar has um, there will be a lot more solar, but it will be a very rocky path. As I mm-hmm. mentioned before, you know, grid is a problem, and every the whole world wants to do it at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but again, if we want to have um, a net, a net zero, um, you know, across everything. Then, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of solar that you would need to create perhaps hydrogen uh, that would then be necessary, you know, for for you know for other sectors like cement or steel or maybe uh, um, um, you know boats or whatever, um, you know, that would be just a massive amount. Um, mm-hmm. So perhaps you know private networks could be something. So perhaps you know powering uh, directly a hydrogen generation facility with with uh, with solar things like that um you know the challenge will be to keep uh the public happy you know sometimes you see those very large solar parks that i think you mentioned also in an earlier podcast which you know from a solar perspective are very exciting mm-hmm. um but uh, sometimes i worry a little bit how that may affect uh, you know, uh, the acceptability or the acceptance of, of people that live nearby. So, you know, um, you know, uh, I think we have to be careful, just like wind. Um, you know, people love the idea of renewables, but nobody wants it really in their back garden. Now, the yeah. benefit of solar is that it is typically only two meters high. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it could still ruin somebody's view who used to be looking on, on green meadow and now he's looking at a blue black sea of solar panels but at least it's not creating you know any mo- moving uh, uh, shadows uh, you know across your 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 property for example but um, yeah i think it will be very challenging uh, there is a huge opportunity of course and i think that you know if you want to have a number it will be very difficult now of course solar is just a few percent if you look at mm-hmm. it worldwide um, mm-hmm. So you know, logically, if you look at everything that is oil and uh, you know everything that's gas, you know, and if we keep nuclear in the mix, which is what it looks like that we're going towards, um, mm-hmm. then um, you know it would have to be double digits for sure, right? Uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. And if um, we are able to every time improve the idea of storage, so of course now with battery storage, now there are other very exciting things with storage, right? Um, Many many different ways of, of doing it. Um, um, you know, I've seen you know a warehouse with cranes that just lifts you know uh, heavy concrete blocks up and down, and that is also storage if you like. So if we find ways to solve that, then we can every time increase the percentage of renewables and solar into the mix. Um, so um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a lot, but it's going to be really complicated getting there. Then we need a lot of support. From governments as well, and I think to uh, to to um, clear the road towards net zero in 2015. Absolutely, uh, I, I did some uh, research uh, last night uh, in preparation for this podcast. You know, the solar may be small as a percentage overall worldwide, but the numbers uh, in comparison to nuclear are absolutely astronomical. Uh, China is, is the top capacity cumulative in gigawatt peak, 575 gigawatts approximately at the end of this year europe 252 gigawatts i think germany will install 14 gigawatt peak this year usa 161 japan 90 india 70 in the uk we are closer to the 15 gigawatt peak mark you know this is the market in which we have most experience there is a boom happening in germany at the moment spain 27 uh, i have here written down i'm not sure if it's correct but what we are heading towards is a potential I'm forecasting a potential boom in the UK solar industry because we need to do five or six gigawatts per year until 2035. And there are new roadmaps being published, but there's massive uh, problems with the grid. You know, uh, people are getting for new developments, grid connection dates of 10, 15 years into the future. Yeah. Do you have any, any, any perspective on that yourself? Are you engaging in any kind of project development work? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, so Kintas has another arm, which is called Kintas Cleantech. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that is our development arm. So um, uh, I'm definitely um, uh, up to speed uh, on that. So you're right. There, there are um, you know uh, grid connections that um, that you can accept now, but won't materialize until you know up to 10, 15 years of the future. So mm-hmm. this is um, you know this is it's very unfortunate that um, that we haven't 
been able to foresee this five or 10 years ago. I also mm-hmm. recognize that it would have been difficult that you asked me 10 years ago, you know, should we invest billions into upgrading the grid? I would probably yeah. have said, well, maybe the money should be spent somewhere else at the moment. Um, but that is what we should have done, really, if we wanted to yeah. have a clear road towards uh, those goals. So, um, yeah, it's very exciting, the numbers that you, uh, that you say, um, and, um, and they will continue to grow uh, for sure. But, um, yeah, the real challenge is, um, you know, it, to develop a site these days can really take a very long time. And then if you add to that the time before the grid becomes available, it, 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 it becomes a very, uh, again, a very strange situation as we're used to in solar i mean we always um it's not ever anything similar to a normal uh average sector out there we always have to do things yeah. in uh, <laughs> in very extreme ways and it's just uh, no different this time but i think as i said before we you know this we can't do this on ourselves by ourselves right we can't create a grid so we can do some private wires but that's not going to solve uh everything so we this needs to be resolved uh, from a government level as well uh, to really be able to meet those those goals. Absolutely, and the project development is an art form in itself. I'm learning as well. You know, and people quoting crazy numbers like two hundred thousand pounds per megawatt peak, and now if you put that in perspective uh, to a large heavy industry user, a steel plant, and there's people knocking on their doors, uh, offering to do free uh, project development, which you know it has a bit of a contradiction. You know, because on the one side you got these curtailment penalties if you're a steel plant or a massive factory, concrete aggregates factory, and you're making bricks if you're exceeding your energy allowance you're getting fined by um, the DNO or the utility, whoever, because you're going above your grid limitation, which sounds perfect for energy storage and solar. But on the other hand, uh, the developers, they tend to focus on projects which are 20 megawatts plus to have a return on investment for spending the money on studies and and get everything, Mm. everything together. So it's an area that I would like to explore in more details as we go forward. You know, we're mm. working on software for this uh, basis as well, uh, try to make it as democratized as possible for people to calculate their own, you know, private wires, you know, something that we, we get into. But in terms of the technology, do you have any any idea about uh, uh, AC coupled or DC coupled uh, solar farms? Sure. Uh, well, I think the answer to that is it depends very much on where you are, um, mm-hmm. you know, in especially in solar in every country deals with it in a different way. Um, you know, um, there are different uh, schemes that um, that would make uh, storage profitable, and mm-hmm. uh, they can be different uh, depending where you are. So, in some countries, AC coupled and having it directly connected to the to the grid uh, would allow you to maybe to connect or to provide services, grid services, uh, in certain ways. But in other places where maybe those grid services are not. Uh, they don't exist, perhaps. So then you rather have a DC coupled, so you can, you know, you can do some big shaving or things like that. So I don't think there is an answer to, uh, you know, a definite answer, in, as in uh, storage should be AC or DC coupled. I think it depends on what is available uh, mm-hmm. to, you know, to create income from uh, at that uh, location where you want to install it. So it's a bit like um, it's a little bit like uh, you know um, central or string inverters. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Some some things just don't seem to uh, end up in uh, in one final uh, point. It doesn't uh, convert to you know the final solution everybody's going to adopt. You still see that designs uh, differ. Uh, you know, throughout the world, from one country to to the other, and even from one uh, developer or designer to to the other. Absolutely, and you know, it's the theory is very different to reality as we as we uh, uh, learn uh, being in the industry for more than a decade already. You know, um, because from from a theoretical point of view, you know, if you, if you're looking at purely for engineering, I would say DC coupled with battery battery and PV makes a lot of sense because you have fewer conversion steps. You can have the same buzz bar for PV as you can for battery circuits, and you know, it seems very nice because we try to focus on energy efficiency, lowering as much as possible. Because we hear investors talking about yield of four percent or eight percent, and we've seen sites which can have eight percent. Uh, uh, power losses only in the cables not considering inverters not considering transformer losses and and so on and other things like you know uh, earth leakage and 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 so on so when we say dc coupled we mean purely 
you lose less energy if you're working on the DC side. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what I meant. But in terms of, because uh, you have such a massive portfolio, in terms of the inverter technology, you know, lots of people seem to be preferring string inverters now. But what, what is your view? Are, do you prefer central or string, or do you see a role for both? Yes, obviously a very good question that uh, <laughs> I've discussed many times <laughs> over the mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Um, now that time has passed, I think there is another element to take into account that maybe wasn't so obvious earlier on. And that is the um, the moment of repowering. You know, in the early days, you would have your maintenance reserve account. And that mm-hmm. was mostly calculated based on uh, the fact that you the averters would need to be exchanged after 10, 12, or 15 years, depending on which financial base case you're looking at. And, um, you know, but we didn't really think about what that would look like. So mm-hmm. now that this period, this time has now come. And, uh, you know, there are people, there are funds and owners out there that now need to replace uh, inverters. And, um, of course, what you find is um, that things have moved on. So, Mm -hmm. for example, inverters have changed voltage, Um, Mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you you know, on the DC side, for example, you now work with a higher voltage. Um, The the capacity of of central inverters, and well, for both of them, have have increased, right? Mm -hmm. uh, In 2000. um, Eight, for example, I installed um, the string inverter was a, a six kilowatt SMA Sunny Boy, right? That was a string inverter. And now yeah. a string inverter is a 250K, uh, uh, you know, uh, Huawei or, or SunGrow or whatever. Um, yeah. So, and of course, with the central that has gone from, you know, in Spain, because of the tariff, uh, you know, you, you, we need to have 100 kilowatt inverters. And um, so that was a central inverter, it was a 100 kilowatt inverter. Now, of course, you have a, a four megawatt inverter. Um, mm-hmm. So you can't, and, and of course, the other thing is nobody, nobody's going to keep those old systems in their portfolio, you know, if you are a manufacturer, because, you, you know, you, you can't, that would be means that you need to have every year you make a new system. So after 15 years, you would need to have 15 systems mm-hmm. in, in your portfolio um, for sale. So they are no longer there. So Mm -hmm. you can't take away one system and put in another system. So uh, for any solution, whether it's, uh, you know, central or string, this is causing a problem. But um, uh, if you don't, but you you know, so, so you almost certainly need to rewire your, 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 your strings, et cetera. One thing that we've seen happening a few times, interesting solution is um, to put uh, string inverters, but centralized. So right. what you do is you don't want to rewire your site. So you don't mm-hmm. still want to run all the cables towards a central location. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then because you can't really get, uh, you know, the old one megawatt uh, station anymore, you put four 250 kilowatts string inverters and then you hook it all up together, for example. You know, along these lines, uh, you know, we've seen activity, we've seen uh, repowering being done in this way. Uh, so that's an unexpected uh, route, maybe, right? Uh, that, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, to use uh, string inverters that were obviously distributed, but use them centralized uh, as a answer to the situation that we're in today. Absolutely. And in terms of modules as well, the sizes have completely changed. So practically, if you need to replace modules, you know, in terms of repowering, uh, you know, it, it, what sort of challenges you might face? Yeah, no, that's also a very good point. Of course, a lot of sites are repowering um, or maybe they have to deal with, uh, they had maybe an accident, uh, a wind accident or a theft, and they now need new panels that also happens. And you're right, the old panels, they don't exist anymore or Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they may exist, but uh, it's complicated. Um, So the most uh, logical way forward usually is that you would depopulate uh, part of your site Ideally, mm-hmm. for example, the area that's connected to one inverter or one MPPT of one inverter, and mm-hmm. uh, you would lift those panels and use those in the rest of your site as spares, and mm-hmm. then you would repopulate that that area with the new panels. So that will lead to maybe a different uh, electrical design, um, but mm-hmm. because it's connected to all together to one MPPT of one inverter, and that should work. But you may find that you need to um, make changes to your structure. Um, so, you know, this is complicated because the manufacturer of the structure may not be there anymore or not be willing to sign mm-hmm. off a, a, a design change. 
Uh, so mm-hmm. and as an investor where you you know you have to you can't just you know make a change in your design and hope for the best you know you can't have panels being blown off and hit somebody uh, you know and, and create so you need to always know that everything that you do is technically sound so you mm-hmm. know the challenges mm-hmm. are how can I uh, you know if the panels are for different size how do I know that they're really compatible what do I need to do to the structure who can sign it off for me um, you know what do I need to do electrically but typically if you can't get the same panel, so you can't do like for like, you can't just lift one out and put another one in. If that's not possible anymore, the trick is to, you know, to depopulate one area of your plant. Use those for spares. Th- those can be popped in any rails on site, and then just repopulate that whole area with new panels. Fantastic. Uh, you know, um, you raise a very important point, which is lots of the companies that were there in the early days and don't exist anymore. You know, and. Uh, uh, to have some sort of continuity going forward is lots of new entries. Lots of EPCs don't exist anymore either. And so for me, it's uh, been very exciting uh, talking to you because you've been in the industry from almost the very beginning, working with space-based solar cells uh, with concentrated <laughs> photovoltaics. It's the first I've, I've heard about it, and I will certainly read more into that. And uh, and ho- hopefully when people are working with you and contacting you, they, they get you know the experience that you have and I hope you will stay involved in 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 the PV business for the next uh, few decades at least. And uh, you know, <laughs> I've certainly enjoyed this uh, podcast, uh, um, and and will listen back and and think deeply about the things you you you've said. But uh, yeah, any any last words for for your listeners before we we, we finish our session? Well, I mean, first of all, Vikram, I, I really en- enjoyed this uh, this session as well very much, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and I enjoyed mm-hmm. very much the previous ones that um, that you've done. Um, so, uh, and I hope you'll do many more. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be listening and um, I'll be um, uh, posting them on my LinkedIn page as well. I, yeah, I've heard already from some of my contacts that they were very um, happy to have found your podcast. So I think this is going to mm-hmm. be a big success. And uh, well, about speaking uh, or a message to the listeners. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there, I, I, uh, I can only say that... Um, if um, if there's anything uh, that you need, anything uh, that I can help with, uh, you know, feel free uh, to get in touch. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, challenges out, out there. And um, as I said before, every day you're learning something else. Every day there is another problem that uh, a solution is found for. So, um, you know, that's uh, what I enjoy most. most. So um, if, um, you know... Uh, any uh, any challenges in the in the solar sector, uh, technical mm-hmm. of nature? Mm-hmm. I'll be very happy to learn about them and get involved. Perfect. Thanks very much for joining us, Arnold. Thank you, Vikram. Thanks.